Joey, what did you think of the U.S. airstrikes? I mean, what, what's your opinion about? Um, I'm sure they make mistakes, like the guys who were there before, and, and they, you know, didn't hit their um, their arm or anything like that. But from what I've noticed, uh, they're they're about as effective as they can be, and the problem lies in the forces on the ground utilizing the, uh, the air strikes you know, to their advantage. Um, I remember one specific defensive position in Rojava. Um, There's a village maybe two, three clicks away, uh, away from us to our 11, and, and I mean they got hammered for to two to three weeks. They would get hammered every other day, and um, there were, there was another uh, tabor that was uh, over on our left, a bit closer to the village. They would never never try to take it. They just kind of just sat there, and I'm not sure why there was a lull, but. Um, it, it would. It, they're as effective as they can be. You know, uh, it, it, a lot of it. A lot of it matters if the forces on the ground are going to push up right after the airstrikes happen, or so just going to stand by and question of up. coordinating the airstrikes yeah. with the ground forces. Uh, exactly. To take advantage. That that village. I mean, it got hammered, and there, you know the buildings were destroyed, but they had plenty of time to reinforce. And we would sit there on guard. We would literally watch. They had a. A road, maybe a click behind the village, that would constantly just bring people to reinforce the village back because they had that data mm -hmm. to recover from the airstrikes. And, I mean, a lot of people don't think of it from the perspective that 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 those those bombs cost a lot of money. So they're not just you know the U.S. and the, the coalition itself is not just going to just continuously drop those bombs if you're not going to really take a position. So um, you have ROEs too, and yeah, positive. They sure they have to positive the idea yeah. through thermal. Yeah, absolutely, uh, yeah. I think that's why they've been blowing up a lot of things like tanks and artillery pieces oh, it's because it's right. stuff that pilots can visually identify from the air. And in other cases, they, as we talked about before, they have to send JTACs in and actually get eyes on, right. and intelligence, etc. Um, let's get into this phenomena of foreign fighters. Uh, you know, the, the Dash have their foreign fighters a lot more than we do on, on the good guy's side. Um, we've seen numbers, I saw numbers like a year ago, they're like 30,000 foreigners oh, wow. signing up with the ISIS. Maybe there's, maybe that's not a correct number, but we can all agree it's a lot. Yeah, a lot of people. Um, here on the good guy's side, farmers come and join the YPG, Peshmerga. Um, we've seen other people join up with the Christian militias. Um, what do you guys make of, of of this phenomenon? What do you think of these people who show up? Yeah, you get all types. You get all types. You get people. You, you even get guys who are just trying to scam people for money. You know, sort of go fund me and just go around take pictures. Like I'm over here, send me money. Yeah, you know? yeah. And you get guys who, you know, didn't get to do much in their military career, so they want to come over here. I mean, I, I feel a little bit of that. Um, you, you get guys who are just glory hounds, want to come over here for a few months and say, oh look, I went and, went and fought, and I'm, I'm a soldier, I'm a warrior now. Or you get people who legitimately want to help Kurdistan, you get people who fit a few categories. Um, it, it's, it's just a wide variety of people um, that you meet. And, you, know, um, you meet people who are very professional and uh, over here doing great things. You meet guys who are just complete asshats who don't belong you're an airsoft gun, let alone a real rifle, you know. Civilians, too. Yeah. Um, I've met quite a few over in the job, and not so many here. It seems a lot of the guys that have take seem to have military background, but uh, I met a handful of guys that have just, uh, there's this one guy, says, uh, I forget his name, he's from Alaska, he just kind of just came over here, didn't tell his parents, just decided to just come over, he had no military experience, and, not, and he never really talked about why he wanted to come. I tried to ask him, you know, I was like, hey, you know, I just, uh, I was trying to be an asshole. So I knew he was a civilian. I asked him why he came, and he got really defensive. and was like, you know, don't worry about it. He apologized later, but never, never actually got back to me on it. But <laughs> he ended up doing the training over in, over with the FA game. He got, uh, he got shot in the leg with BKC during training. In training. Yeah, in training. He, he went back home. Yikes. There's another guy from, um, from Iran, and he was—he wasn't Kurdish. He was actually uh, from Iran. Um, really, really motivated guy. He was—he was a civilian too, but he was uh, really willing to learn. And, you know, we tried to teach him some things when we were in the mountains. And, um, he ended up going over. He went through the training with a guy who got shot in the leg, got sent to a different tech board, and he actually ended up—he uh, 
died during a firefight. I think they said he took him around in the leg, uh, lower abdomen on the he side, out. and he bled out from lack of you know, lack of care. I guess they didn't they didn't put pressure on the wounds or anything like that. Um, one of the other foreigners. This is just what I've heard. I talked to the guy who was with him because I had met the guy and he was a really good guy. I wanted to know what happened. Um, put pressure on the wound. Uh, eventually, put him in a truck. Um, and I guess when the truck started moving out, all the bumpiness and all that, he started bleeding again. Blood clot. Yeah, and he just it just ended up bleeding out. It's something that could have definitely he could have definitely lived through it. I think. But what would the two of you say to other foreigners who are thinking about coming over? joining. Um, I think we're incredibly lucky to be where we are um, and doing what we're doing. It's, it's kind of hit or miss on who you end up with, where you go, who the contacts are you make, and what you end up doing as a volunteer. You might just sit around holding guard, you know. It's, it seems it's, like it has so much to do with like what crap you fall in with. Right, know. for sure, and who you are and the decisions you choose to make. Um, patience is a big thing. It's Kurdistan. And we like to make the joke of, so you want me there at 10.30? You want me there at 10.30 Kurdish time? I'm like, it's like an hour later, or you know? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's sometimes things take a while, and you don't get a lot of intelligence coming towards you as a Westerner, so you just kind of, mm-hmm. they're, they're kind of in the dark. Yeah, all the time. Not, not so much anymore for us, like I said, we're pretty lucky now with where we are, but it, um, if you want to come over here and do it, and you know, you, you, no one else's opinion should really play into your mind at that point. Like, I, if you want, if you want to be here and you think you want to do this, you know, go for it. But it, you can have all sorts of preconceived notions about what it is over here and what it's like living here and doing this. And if you don't have an open mind about it, and you're not well, like willing to learn, and um, you're gonna have a hard time. A lot of guys couldn't get out of that Western military mindset, and they could not mesh with the Pesh for that very reason. They could not fight the way they did, or you know, adapt their their methods and tactics to the environment the situation. Um, in the next time. No, because the the weapons are different, the culture is different, the way right. of fighting, everything, everything. You can't just graft, and that's the problem we make, in my opinion, in American special forces and stuff. We try to graft. U.S. military doctrine on top of all of these foreign cultures, mm-hmm. and it just doesn't work a lot of times. You know, you have to adapt it to the local situation. I, I don't necessarily have an opinion on that matter, but I think we do kind of see that here in, in with, even with Kurdistan, where they're trying to do this, and it, it takes um, such a CTG. I mean, they've been working with them, the advisor have been working with them for like a year now, and I don't know too much about them, but I do know it's taken a long time to get them where they are. Mm-hmm. And now they're they're doing shoot houses and stuff like that, but um, even at this point, how applicable is it all at the moment until it is war? Right. This is a very conventional war right now right. in so many ways. Well, what about you, Joey? Somebody sent you a message on uh, on the internet, sent you an email and said, hey, Joey, I'm thinking of coming over to uh, to Kurdistan. Want to join up with Peshmerg and fight ISIS? What, what would you say to them? Um, for the most part, you just it, I would want them to make sure that they actually can can help and that they're prepared to to be here for a while and actually not waste resources and this kind of thing that you see with a lot of people that come over here. They just uh, waste logistics and resources. Decide that they can't they can't hack it. They leave. You know, it's food and it's equipment and ammunition. If you're lucky to get into a firefight that somebody else could have used, but. Um, you know, like he was saying, if, if you feel like it's your duty to come over here and you want to come over here, just, just do your research and have an open mind. Don't come over here and, and, you know, spend a month or two or say if you go to Rojava, you know, use use all those logistics and use that spot that could have been for somebody else is prepared to stay for the long haul. You know, you get over there and they go through all this work to, to get you there and then three weeks in you decide you want to leave and then they... You know, even in Rojava too. So they sometimes they they pay for people's plane tickets to get home. So that's also money that you're taking out of their pockets because you know you didn't think your decision through before you came. Yeah, that, but that puts a bad uh, it image a, towards all of us. Yeah, it gives you know, us a bad rep. Perception is reality, and yeah. then they look at all of us like, oh, well, you're probably just a, a cowboy or a war tourist. Mm-hmm. You know, and you 
you also want to make sure if you ask somebody who's over here to ask different people, because I've noticed some of the guys who are over here are kind of a bit salty about it, or people who went home, um, you know, they, they'll talk negatively Just about it and try to, it. yeah, and they'll try to try to dissuade you from coming over. Try to talk to somebody who's neutral. I, I tried, I stay neutral, you know, but I noticed when I was coming out of Rojava, the guys I was with, there was like 13 guys leaving, you know, there were new guys coming in, yeah, and they yeah. were just all trying to tell me, you know, it's going to suck, that you're going to be sitting on a berm doing nothing, and I was like, the guys, just, they're here, let them see what it is for themselves, just give them, give them an open mind, you know, you can't just be negative about it, you know, yeah. this is a good cause to help with, just make sure that they know they have to be prepared for it. It's a long-term project. There's a yeah. lot of different situations you can be put in, so I mean, everybody's perspective on the whole thing. Difference as yeah. well as volunteer. Experiences may vary in this year.